Roger Reine is the founder and CEO of Scott Trade Inc., which he created in order to provide investors with a better way to invest and make their own trading decisions. Today, Scott Trade has the largest branch network among any online brokerage and empowers clients through online trading tools and stock market research to buy stocks online. So before we talk about this incredible company that you've built, I'd like to go back to your college days since we're here in the context of the centennial celebration of the True Last College of Business. When you graduated, you have discussed that you had two choices. You could have joined a major corporation and leveraged your engineering degree and earned, I believe at the time, $1,200 a month, which must have been a very tempting salary, or become one of Edward Jones' first management trainees and leverage your business education, but at a much lower salary of $400 a month. And you famously chose to go down your business path. Can you talk to us about why that was your choice and what led you to make your decision in that way? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, probably first of all, I, I did love the stock market. I just found it fascinating mm -hmm. and had been buying stocks for quite a few years by the time I got out of college. Another reason was because I had worked at Edward Jones uh, as a quasi-intern, uh, summers and vacations, and really, uh, really had a great time, got to learn a lot. I got exposure to all of the partners of the firm. Mm -hmm and uh, truly enjoyed and uh, respected them and uh, wanted to work with them and learn more about the brokerage business. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did your, the people who you would have shared that decision with feel about your financial choice at that time? I didn't share it with anybody. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really care about the financial consequences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've had enough savings that I didn't have to worry about maximizing my monthly income, mm -hmm. thank goodness. So. I think there's a really good lesson in that, though, for our graduates to really think about more, and especially in the, in the conversation that you see in the press about higher education right now and return on investment largely being driven by what the starting salary is for that first job after graduation, that, of course, that's very important, but that there might be other considerations and much bigger picture things to look at. And I think uh, uh, one could argue that you made a good choice <laughs> well, at I that time. Well, I think so. I, I had a... Uh, had gotten an MBA, a, a, a good education at, mm -hmm. at Mizzou, but I think I, I kind of got a PhD in, in stock brokerage from Edward Jones and Company because mm -hmm. I got to be in on key decisions uh, throughout the organization because it was small. It was small enough that I could have access to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a bigger company, that usually doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So That's small true. or middle size isn't a bad choice. I think for for graduates. Especially understanding your goals at the time and what you wanted to accomplish in that first job out. So after you were with Edward Jones for a while and became a partner, you chose to leave and create your own company. So what do you think attracted you to that entrepreneurial environment and pulled out your inner entrepreneur? Well, I think I just felt like I wanted to run my own firm and uh, I did not think I would make it to managing partner of Edward Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't a strong salesman. In fact, that was the opposite. And uh, I think a, in a sales organization as they were and still are, a salesman is what you need to lead that type of an organization, a good salesman. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I, if I wanted to really go out and run my own business or be in charge of a business, I would probably have to do it on my own and uh, the discount brokerage business at the time was the perfect avenue because sales didn't matter it was mm -hmm. all about giving great customer service and charging people a greatly reduced commission for not having provided the advice that uh, was typical in the brokerage business at that time mm -hmm. that's interesting when we have young talent coming through now who know that they feel entrepreneurial but don't necessarily know how to direct it, sometimes they have a hard time articulating what you've just described, that they know m more importantly than having the big idea that they want to be in charge of their own destiny. So it's very helpful for them to hear that from your perspective and where you thought was the right time to move and what attributes made you think that this was the right 
direction to move in to leverage your own sense of entrepreneurialism. So Scott Trade's business model empowers individual investors with financial management autonomy, as you were just describing. What would you consider to be the primary reasons people are drawn to this kind of investment structure or investing mechanism? I think the main driver that, that uh, propelled self-directed investing at the beginning was economics, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, you could spend over $900 in commission to buy 1,000 shares of IBM. And obviously, wow. if you think buying and selling could be close to $2,000 commission for just 1,000 shares, people didn't tend to trade too much back and forth because the commissions would take all your profit away. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the discount brokerage industry lowered those costs dramatically to 25 to $50 maybe at the time. So that was the main impetus. But as it's matured uh, into a mostly an online self-directed business, uh, it's probably the information flow that has, that has propelled it for the last 10 or 15 years. The customers are smarter, they're better educated, and they have so much more to, uh, to see on the web than they ever did uh, when they were going to the library and looking through a, a standard poor book. So Absolutely. plenty of information. People with a lot of college degrees are the ability to analyze things and make up their own mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cost is still important, but maybe not quite like it was at the beginning. It's interesting. Today, we would call that kind of change in a market a disruption, which is one of those words that has both a negative and a positive connotation. But we know in our modern vocabulary and use of that word that it means a fundamental move the needle shift, which is exactly what you did. So how do you gauge the appetite for the disruptive investment model that you created? How do you um, measure whether it's working or not working? Well, I think we've always uh, measured it just by how we compare it to our competition. It's really hard to, especially at the beginning, to know what was out there because mm -hmm. it mushroomed into a much larger industry and a much more used method of investing than anybody would have ever thought, probably. So mm -hmm. we just continue to try to improve our services, our offerings, our customer service, make sure the cost doesn't go up. And uh, with some good marketing, we tend to just continue to grow the firm. Let's talk about customer service, something that you're really known for. You've said that Scott Trade survived early on solely through heroic customer service efforts. What do you think distinguishes your customer service model and how are you staying ahead of others who are trying to catch you? Well, I think our biggest differentiator is and has been for really the, the lifetime of the firm, the fact that we've chosen to deliver our client services primarily through our branch network. Mm -hmm. So we've opened 500 offices. Uh, no one else has bothered to open 500 offices in the online brokerage arena. And uh, I believe that those offices provide a local and a motivated uh, touch that is hard to duplicate uh, with one call center somewhere in the United States. So I think that's been our primary, uh, our primary uh, uh, characteristic that's enabled us to compete and grow in this industry. Mm -hmm. So on the other side of that coin is the technology and the access to information that you were talking about earlier. You were willing, and Scott Trade was willing, to be a very early adopter of a variety of the tools that have made this information so available and different technological solutions from the internet back in the mid-90s, mobile app investing today. How do you all as a firm, or what is your strategy for evaluating new technology and deciding which makes sense to keep you who you are and yet leverage this resource and which is just flash in the pan that you're going to disregard? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. We have uh, over 800 people in our IT area, and of course they're not all evaluating new technology, mm -hmm. but we have a huge component of, of IT professionals. We have uh, quite a few people in our product development and, uh, and digital marketing area that we rely on to evaluate what's coming. And of course we look at our competition, as most people do. What's what are they doing? Are they on to something that we mm -hmm. need to be on to? And between all of that put together, uh, 
and a little bit of common sense, we, we weed out what we don't think is too important to the investor. Mm -hmm. Imagine common sense when talking about technology. <laughs> what yeah. a very novel concept. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that, when, when you study Scott Trade and study some of the things that you all have accomplished, boils down into a pretty unique company culture that we've talked about when I visited you before. You've created a culture here for which you've been publicly recognized repeatedly, deservedly so. We discovered a story when we were preparing for this that we really think illustrates the sincerity and impact of that culture. The story of in the company's 25th year of operation, your employees contributing their own money to restore your vintage Corvette. What elements of the company culture do you think really create that kind of very special working environment? Well, there's, there are probably a lot of answers to that. Uh, I think one can be just the, the, the size of the company at the time. I mean, it isn't so big that most people don't know you pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's big enough that they can husband their resources and pull off something that, that did cost quite a bit of money. Yeah. So perhaps the size of the company, but we, we go out of our way to try to be sure that everyone, whether they're in a branch 2,000 miles away or here in the same building where I am, uh, are kept up to date on what's going on in Scott Trade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we try to keep it light. We want people to have fun. We want them to enjoy their job. If they don't enjoy their job, I really would prefer they go somewhere else and work. It's not worth it mm -hmm. to, to work for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have that kind of a fun atmosphere sometimes that uh, makes us all friends as well as uh, co-workers. And I think that's a very positive culture if one can get there and, and then keep it as they grow. It's a real treasure. And I'm sure that car, every time you look at it, is a nice reminder of how what you've done has really permeated into the It's in the, the garage today. I yes. bet it yeah. is, I bet it is. So back when you used to interview every potential Scott Trade employee, you famously evaluated for one thing consistently and that was ego. Can you tell us about why and what that told you about how you were building the team that you were just describing? Well, I would always look for, uh, I would say, personality first. I mean, obviously you want someone with, with a background that lends talent to your organization. Sure. <laughs> but that given, uh, I, I always looked at their personality and I wanted somebody that I liked that I could see myself working with and spending a lot of time with. And if someone appeared to have too big of an ego, I passed on them. Uh, I don't think you can have too many big egos and have good teamwork mm -hmm. and good camaraderie and a good culture. So I would rather have very few big egos mm -hmm. and just good people that get along with each other working here. Mm -hmm. We do now in, in the uh, back at school, <laughs> we do a lot of personality assessment and leadership assessment mm -hmm. and leadership coaching. And we have a lot of buzzwords and vocabulary and terminology for different types of attributes that if you boil it all down and use some common sense like you were talking about earlier really tie back to exactly what you're saying which is to understand who makes sense on your team and in some cases you could imagine having a lot of big egos would be perfect for another organization but uh, a very unique intuition that you had in building your team to see how that would not be the case here and, and look at what it's yielded. It really is remarkable how as you grow, you retain the culture. It's unusual and it, I'm glad that you get a lot of recognition for that. So let's talk about some of the new talent and young people as investors and also we'll talk in a minute about as new employees. Mm -hmm. So young people have grown up during a very market volatile era and yet your surveys show consistently, and I understand a new one has just come out, that they are a very fast growing share of your investors. What do you think, or how would you attribute that, uh, that what drives their interest in investing, especially among this millennial generation? Well, I think there are a lot of people, and they've been widely quoted, that have worried some of the younger folks in this country about uh, Social Security and don't expect it to be there because I don't think it will be there. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's, uh, that's more widely held belief than, than one might want to believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's perverse. And uh, I think younger, younger adults are saying, what, what if that's right? 
I need to start early because compounding is a huge advantage, as, as you know. Of course. And mm -hmm. I think it's just sobered them up and made them want to take it a little more seriously than maybe we did back in the 70s or 80s. Mm -hmm. I think they would be glad to know that you think that they are forward thinking. Well, That's, I think they are. I think I, so too. I appreciate them mm -hmm. very much. We work with them every day, and so some of the uh, that it, it doesn't, I agree with you completely, but it isn't necessarily how they're often depicted. And I think their behavior, this unique indicator you have in seeing this market share grow, is very in, informative about their behavior and what their long-term plans are. So we are preparing this generation of millennials, hopefully to be customers, clients, and employees of mm -hmm. companies like Scott Trade. And one of the main things we do that overlaps with what you all do is we have the Mizzou Student Managed Investment Fund, which I think you're familiar with, million dollar plus um, assets under management that they manage in real time on Bloomberg terminals in a fully functioning trading room. Do you think that uh, mimicking the environment that they would see here is the best way to prepare them? Do you think that that's uh, what you would have wanted to see in someone coming in the door? Or do you have other thoughts on what it takes to get ready for a career in this industry? Well, I think what you're doing is, is fantastic. It, Thank you. Uh, the, <laughs> the students that have an interest are, have a place to go and, and experiment mm -hmm. and find out what it's all about. And I think that's that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, a couple of other things that, that I would recommend for any student, business or otherwise, would be to maximize the internship capability and get ha hold as many jobs as you can through college and get out there and get a feel for what you're good at, what maybe you're not so good at, what's interesting to you and what absolutely doesn't interest you. And so I think internships are a great way to figure out what do I want to do when I get out mm -hmm. and maybe even find an employer as I did that I want to go to work for when mm -hmm. I get out. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important and I also think that if you have an interest in, in um, economics or the stock market or finance that you should spend the money to have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal and you should start reading it in college and you should, uh, they're very thick these days. The Wall Street Journal has used to be mm -hmm. 25 or 30 pages <laughs> and you could cover it in, a, in an hour. Well now it's very, very thick and it has so much information. You can't read it all, but certainly to go through and pick out articles that are either educational or of interest. I think is a, a great way to spend two or three hundred dollars a year for someone that's got an interest in finance. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott Trade is really well known for being really on the fore for internships and and much in the partnership that uh, the True Last College Business has with Scott Trade. I know you employ three hundred and fifty plus interns a year. All of our students have to do an internship, largely driven by advice and observation of companies like yours, especially companies like yours that convert those interns into permanent hires, which you do at very high numbers. But I think, so our students, whether they realize it or not, have to have this experience that you were mm -hmm. describing, but that added piece that you're suggesting that they also plug into current events and start to over time develop a sense of how those events relate to each other and what it would mean for the work that they're doing is something that they have to do on their own. And so I think that's really good advice for them to think about uh, leveraging as they look forward for how they would take advantage of their education. So uh, sort of building on that thought, of course, I'm in the education business and we're very proud that you're an alum of our college, but we always want to make sure, ideally, we would graduate everyone who comes out of the school with the capacity to build and, and, and do something um, perhaps not quite to the extent that you have it being so remarkable, but that they could do exactly what they want to be doing in the way that you've described. What do you think we need to do as educators to maximize our ability to equip our students to be successful? I think in this day and time, you need to be sure that the students coming out are technologically proficient. Uh, you can't get out of school today and not be intimately familiar with spreadsheets and, and uh, uh, the internet and computers in general and, uh, and software and things that, that are current. Uh, that didn't exist when I was, we had a slide rule. That was our <laughs> method of I, me too. I solving remember, yeah. problems. <laughs> and and uh, so I think, uh, I think that's something that 
you just have to be sure they're up on, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Uh, the other thing that I would say is to professionalize them to the extent that you can. And I know you've got one program where you actually try to be sure that they dress right, act right, talk right, know how to converse and, pre and present a professional image. I think that's really important mm -hmm. and uh, they need to walk out of school knowing how to do that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's a huge advantage when you go out and look for a job or your first year or two on the job. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, the program you're referring to is uh, not surprisingly called the professional development program along the lines of what you're exactly what you're saying but I, I want to note that we're able to offer that program in the way that we do because we're able to bring them over to companies like yours where they then get mentored or they serve as interns and we're very grateful for that partnership on behalf of the students so if we were to flip that from what we should be offering them in terms of technology and professionalism as you were describing to the student's responsibility in this equation. What do you think a student should do with the opportunity that an education offers in order to be ready to face this very challenging market and world that they're entering upon graduation? Well, I think they should take their education seriously, and uh, that doesn't mean you have to make all A's, but uh, I certainly did not. <laughs> I did find myself, though, buried in the basement stacks of the library, struggling to learn material that uh, in some cases I, I've never touched again, mm -hmm. but uh, you've got to take it seriously, you've got to try, and I think uh, extracurricular things certainly come in handy. I was not big on that, should have been, but it wasn't, but mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing that they should concentrate on a little bit, whether it's comfortable or not, push yourself, get out there and make some things happen among some of the organizations around town or campus. Mm -hmm. So I think those are two things that uh, they should do and get an internship. I think that's the, the most important maybe yes. of all. Yeah. Uh, we agree completely so. It's been so long I, that the campus isn't even the same as it was. I mean I, I have to get lost when I go up there now. The campus the buildings looks beautiful. Look the, same. the campus looks yeah. beautiful but we're always real we're very proud of the campus but what we're most proud of is when we get a chance to see alums like you succeed. It's a tremendous point of pride for the university as a whole to see what you've done in in your success leading this business. But for me personally as a dean responsible for with a lot of responsibility for the next generation of hopefully future business leaders to see you be able to describe how you were true to yourself the entire time. And we really think that's a big part of our culture that we prepare the students internships, professionalism as you were describing, but that when we say um, we'll promise you, we'll show you a better business education that when they are the founder and CEO and leader of a tremendous nationally recognized moved the needle organization that they can say and I did it because this is what made sense for me that I figured out what fit within my skill set and the kind of people I wanted to surround myself with and you see results of being true to that so that's really a, a lovely reminder for us of why we're doing all of this well Missouri University is a is a wonderful institution and uh, Thank you. I can tell you it it was all I needed I mean I did not make straight A's, so I left a little bit on the table. <laughs> uh, but I, I tried to pull everything my limited brain power would allow me to, and uh, it was a lot of fun and a, and a wonderful experience going to school there. So That's wonderful to hear. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you today my and pleasure. helping us celebrate our centennial, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. My pleasure.